Caribbean tourism sector is projected to experience strong growth in 2019, with a 6% increase in air arrivals and a 4% growth in cruise traffic, a sector where the region is the dominant global player, owning year-on-year 30% -year of cruise market share. The most northerly of the Caribbean islands, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, experienced double-digit growth in tourism visitor arrivals of 11%, or 17% stopover arrivals in 2018, which was further supported by increased room inventory, increased average daily rates, and expenditure reminiscent of the country's performance in the good old days before the 2009 global recession. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Bahamas, it is flanked to the north by the state of Florida in the United States and to the west by Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. The country has had a long-standing relationship with Germany through its 60-odd years of patronage of the International Tourism Bourse, or ITB, and has maintained a tourism presence in Germany since then, and we continue to welcome a steady stream of Germans to our shores annually. German nationals who come to the Bahamas, who came to the Bahamas in the early 60s and 70s, fell in love with our 700 islands and eventually established small family island hotel properties, some of which continue to operate even today. And it has become generational as quite a number of the descendants of the original German investors now own vacation homes and continue to contribute to the development of our local communities. There were also those Germans who came to visit and eventually stayed, having fallen in love with our beautiful Bahamian women and who now call the Bahamas home. <laughs> As an archipelagic nation, the Bahamas is spread over 100,000 square miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Its greatest challenge, that of its dispersed territory, is mitigated only by location some 50 miles from the U.S. coast, with strategic proximity to international air and sea routes in global trade with an exclusive 200 nautical mile economic zone. The country's productive sectors of international banking, oil bunkering, maritime industries, transshipment and logistics have thrived and benefited from the global recognition we have garnered by our tourism industry. The country is renowned for its pristine beaches, friendly and creative people, educated workforce, and its vibrant tourism economy, which made up an overall contribution to GDP of 48% and 55% to employment in 2017. There are, however, major de de developmental constraints stemming from challenges of access and transport. The country operates 61 airports, of which 27 are certified as international gateways. Just 30 of the 700 islands and keys that make up the archipelago are inhabited with an intricate network of paved roads covering just 50% of the country's total landmass. Despite its challenges, however, tourism has enabled the Bahamas to develop and maintain an enviable standard of living within the wider Caribbean region. Gross, gro gross domestic product in 2018 was 12.9 billion US dollars, and the country continues to enjoy the region's highest GDP per capita of 23,000 US dollars. More than 90% of the population receives access to drinking water and sanitation services, as well as electrification and communications infrastructure. Mobile usage has seen full penetration, and 81% of the population are internet users, my 84-year-old mother excluded. <laughs> Tourism, then, is seen as being a linchpin for development, stability, and prosperity for the Bahamas and for the region. Globally, the tourism story is no different. International tourism receipts grew by 4.6% in 2017 for the seventh consecutive year, outpacing that of the global economy in terms of service exports, capital investment, employment and output, and with 51% of all tourism receipts benefiting European countries, 
thereby making it a critical economic driver of both developed and developing economies. Current international tourism statistics continue to reflect this trend as stayovers worldwide grow by 5.4% for the first nine months of 2018, with 56 million more international visits than in the same period 2017. The, da the data, however, tells a cautionary tale for the Caribbean, which was the only region in 2018 to experience a net decline in international visits. This is a red flag that is concerning to the region's leaders because the Caribbean is the most tourism-dependent region in the world. The industry represents a significant share of the region's service economies, contributing on average 15% of the Caribbean's GDP and 14% of its employment. In most Caribbean states, the sector accounts for more than 25% of GDP, more than double the world average of 10.4%. To further emphasize the point, in the British Virgin Islands, BVI, the sector's total contribute to GDP at 98.5% was the highest share of the countries worldwide. The region's scholars and practitioners continue to acknowledge tourism's positive impacts on economic growth and employment and its propensity for more equitable distribution of income. However, its benefits are viewed as a double-edged sword with a strain of imbalances between host population size and visitor volumes can have devastating consequences from unmanaged growth. The Bahamas, for example, has a population of just 380,000, but receives 6.4 million visitors annually. For Caribbean governments, tourism's potential to propel the region forward must be carefully balanced against the detrimental environmental e impacts on the region's small, fragile ecosystems with true understanding of the carrying costs associated with developing tourism industries. I think it's important to state that historically, Caribbean countries have made strides from 70 years of engagement in the tourism industry. The Bahamas, the first in the region to recognize tourism's economic potential, recorded its first one million stopover visitors by 1978, which was quite an achievement for a country which had a population of just 200,000. Over the next decade, increased demand, foreign investments in branded product, the rise of low-cost carriers, more leisure time, and disposable income of travelers from source markets established tourism's primacy. Other destinations of all also awakened to the potential of tourism, with Jamaica, Aruba, and Cancun rolling out significant hotel product. But by the early 90s, the Gulf War, airline bankruptcies, Pan Am, Eastern Airlines, and recession in the USA had begun to dampen appetites for travel, causing stagnation in the region's tourism economies. The rebound came for the Bahamas in the late 90s, when Sun International, from South Africa, purchased over one billion in tourism real estate assets on Paradise Island and launched the world famous Atlantis, which revitalized brand Bahamas and drove international recognition of the region's ability to reinvent its tourism industry. But by 2001, the region once again plunged into recession, where terrorist attacks on the United States World Trade Center caused the global price of crude to skyrocket and U.S. airline carriers pull flights from Caribbean routes. Although its impacts on the global economy were relatively short-lived, the elevated price of crude had now become a persistent drag on fiscal budgets. Caribbean tourism emerged from 9-11, demonstrating its resiliency as the region's driver of economic growth, trade and employment, and proving that it could once again regenerate to deliver economic prosperity and improve living standards to Caribbean peoples. This remains so until the global financial crisis of 2009, whose origins in deregulation of financial markets, credit growth, and demographic shifts disclose the growing interdependence of state economies in the push towards global integration. The region had previously, previously 
uh, can't say the word. <laughs> acclimated to global shocks, having survived the dismantling of trade preferences, declining aid flows, and the sharp rise in the price of crude. And so, Caribbean countries opted in 2009 to ride out the storm. But the expected rebound did not come. Instead, debt financing for investment projects evaporated, facilitated in part by the collapse of Lehman Brothers and other multinational corporation bankruptcies, which impacted the operations of many of the region's leading tourism plants. In its aftermath, declining long-haul travel from source markets and the precipitous fall-off in tourism demand led to a free fall in Caribbean tourism. In the ensuing years, the region's dependence on crude continued to constrain government revenue, and with no access to credit, new investment did not materialize, leaving governments with little wiggle room for industry responsiveness to stimulate demand. The problem was compounded by the rise of the digital revolution which introduced new products, changed travel purchasing habits, and increased travel expectations for more diversified and better quality products and guest experiences that delivered more value for money. Customer satisfaction and customer relationship management became the lexicon of a new generation of travel practitioners. While the digital revolution enabled developed countries to respond quickly to changing consumer demands, Caribbean countries did not, have this, did not have the capital or technological capacity to reform at a similar pace, further threatening the region's lifeline. The digital transformation of production and consumption mechanisms were not only changing tourism's economic fundamentals, but reducing the need for capital investment transfers. Technological advancements were also spurring diversification of tourism-related sectors as the global tourism market flooded with investments in vacation rentals and other new accommodation products. This time, the region's tourism would be impacted by both internal and external events that would inhibit its development and challenge governments to respond in a way that mandated reform. But there were severe constraints. The use of government revenues to pay interest on the debt and sovereign borrowing to reduce the deficit in the balance of payments had led to higher debt-to-GDP ratios throughout the region, which had a delirious effect on private sector growth and the industry's overall competitiveness. By 2012, of the 19 small countries with debt-to-GDP ratios above 60%, of the 19 small countries with debt-to-GDP ratios above 60%, nine of them were in the Caribbean. Moreover, the recession had cast a spotlight on an area of deficiency which had, overlooked, which had been overlooked by Caribbean governments, that of human capital development. Although the region's soft embrace of technology and related investments was recognized, in the longer term, it would require homegrown development of social capital, more progressive corporate cultures, and substantial investments in technology and education to generate higher paying jobs and attract or retain young talent. According to an IDB study, Caribbean countries had already lost more than 70% of its highly educated labor force through emigration to other countries, primarily the United States. And although remittance flows in some Caribbean countries lessened the rest recession's economic impact, education losses were on average larger than the flow of remittances, with migration adding to the negative shock to Caribbean economies. Future social and technological investments would be vital to build local capacities to increase productivity and broaden basic services. There was also increasing recognition that Caribbean tourism could survive and thrive in the technological age, and that despite its disadvantages, the region would continue to be a desirable place to visit. But the revamped tourism model would require more connectivity to markets and more diversified and managed inventory. It also needed a more integrated and coordinated approach to policy making and execution, as tourism ministries and their support agencies alone could not deliver tourism growth. This could only be achieved through the functional participation of other agencies, a commitment to, to strategic planning and policy formulation, and careful approaches in developing for long-term sustainability. The realization also came that economic recovery in the Caribbean was destined to be much slower 
and more volatile process than in larger countries, and that without a more integrated approach to tourism development, individual Caribbean states could not mitigate structural impediments such as weak connectivity to other sectors, lower productivity, and greater susceptibility to external shocks, coupled with the region's uncompetitive and often unfavorable access to global financial markets. Intensifying climate impacts, too, are increasingly decimating state infrastructure and eroding slim margins in the budgets of Caribbean governments, which were targeting fiscal consolidation and structural reforms. But efforts in this regard have been somewhat eclipsed by extreme weather variability attributed to climate change. The added burden of climate change impacts has once again called into question the sustainability of the Caribbean tourism model as a catalyst for development and a future driver of economic growth. It is true that the Caribbean experiences natural disasters with more frequency and intensity than most regions. The region now faces coastal erosion, loss of beach areas, flooding from sea level rise, degradation of marine resources, ocean acidification and water shortages, all of which will increase the competition for tourism dollars. There was slower recovery of islands from Hurricanes Matthew and Joachim in 2016 and, and the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, the worst in recorded history, has foreshadowed the growing impacts of climate change. Two of the three hurricanes of the 2017 season, Irma and Maria, fractured infrastructure and devastated the economies of several Caribbean countries with economic damages to capital stock as high as 5.7% of GDP annually on average. Some islands experienced loss of capital stock representing more than 100% of their GDP. The World Bank estimated damages to Antigua and Barbuda alone of 222 million or 9% of the country's GDP. Hurricane Maria, a Cat 5 storm, cost $90 billion in damages and evacuations of 70,000 people with an additional 15,000 forced into government shelters. Maria devastated the island of Dominica, causing $1.3 billion in damage, more than twice the country's GDP. Hurricane Erica, two years earlier, caused damages estimated 90% of that country's GDP. Hurricane Irma, another Cat 5 storm, which cloaked sustained winds of 185 miles per hour for 37 hours, caused an estimated damage in the region of $50 billion. In the Bahamas, Irma impacted five islands, or 54,000 per persons. Approximately 3,500 per persons sought refuge in 133 shelters, and damages to comparable sectors totaled $130 million. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimates the full cost of damages from these hurricanes to seven Caribbean destinations at 5.4 billion US dollars, with the public sector bearing the brunt of the costs. The World Travel and Tourism Council reported that the Caribbean in 2017 lost 826,000 international visits, which could have generated 741 million US dollars and supported 11,000 jobs. According to an ELAC study on nine countries in the Caribbean basin, the annual cost to replace hotels and other tourist facilities due to sea level rise will range anywhere from 9 million to 80 million, and the annual loss in tourism income due to the loss of beaches and ecosystems would be anywhere from 550 million to 2.4 billion US dollars. Collectively, the nine countries in their study would incur losses of 44 to 46 billion by the end of the century. Our climate is changing. And the evidence is all around us. Even in your region, snow and ice melts in the Alps is impacting winter tourism. And even more critical, decreasing water levels in the Rhine River, Europe's busiest shipping route, is disrupting freight transport and impacting trade throughout the EU. Small, developing island economies, then, are even more vulnerable than their larger regional counterparts. And associated costs from loss of infrastructure and income will further exacerbate fragile institutional frameworks, making it very challenging for governments to recover. Average annual damages from natural disasters range from 1.6 to 3.6 percent of GDP. Yet in the Bahamas, four of the eight hurricanes experienced since 1990 resulted in total damages estimated at 5 percent of GDP. Although Caribbean governments have implemented disaster preparedness and risk reduction strategies, 
inclusive of a natural disaster saving fund, intensifying impacts from climate change are expected to dampen future growth with dire consequences for the entire region. The Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility, CRIF, provides some insurance coverage, but a regional disaster fund accessible only in the case of a disaster or one, ad or one adaptation and mitigation projects is crucial to buffering the region from the devastating impacts of global warming. Those countries that, are, that emerged unscathed from the 2017 hurricane season are now experiencing accelerated growth in tourism receipts. But by all accounts, it will take the region four years to, to recover from these weather events. However, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that where there, is no, where there are no additional effort, efforts to constrain CO2 emissions, mean temperatures will likely increase by 2.5 degrees centigrade in 20, 2100, resulting in higher tropical cyclone damages of 18 to 31 percent. Anyone with common sense would say then, find another solution to propel the region's economic growth. But tourism has continued to offer Caribbean states a quick fix with your insurance receipts and reconstruction of commercial and residential facilities, injecting domestic capital and creating jobs. And so, while some may argue that the industry is unsustainable, others would say it's not the industry, but the management and mode of delivery that must change. As tourism's relative rapid recovery from hurricanes and natural disasters remains vital to the region's economic well-being. Climate and other environmental factors are increasingly key components of decision-making when tourists choose a warm, water, warm weather vacation and the strength of Caribbean resilience and recovery is increasingly viewed within the context of more diversified tourism economies where capital flows can shift towards higher value-added and environmentally sensitive destination offerings. The Bahamas, for example, has seen tremendous growth in the use of its ecological assets in development of experiences around fly fishing, bird watching, snorkeling, eco advantages. This suggests that with lower energy costs, technological application, and promotion of biodiversity, the countries of the region can, in fact, pivot to deliver investments in new products and experiences that have huge appeal to travelers and provide much needed revenues to support industry diversification and boost overall competitiveness as tourism destinations. Notwithstanding the impacts of climate change, most studies show that tourism investments will continue to be the primary driver of job creation and economic growth, not only in the Caribbean, but worldwide. However, within the Caribbean, Innovation in its model and application can expand its economic reach and continue to enable Caribbean countries to improve poverty levels, foster entrepreneurship, and, sus and stimulate sustainable business growth. <laughs> How the region will seek to capitalize on these opportunities, strategically plan tourism development, work with investors to develop new attractions, collectively work to improve connectivity, devise strategies to lower operational costs, use technology to improve service delivery, change culture to attract talent and employ best practices to improve domestic output, will in the long run determine whether tourism will continue to serve the small island developing states of the region as a model for growth development for many years to come. I want to thank you for allowing me to make this presentation to this August group. And will you have a great afternoon? Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And please, please welcome questions and comments. Start here. If you could uh, stand up and briefly introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Lenz. I'm studying economics and development. Uh, thank you, first of all, very much for your speech. I had a lot of information that was really interesting. Um, I just have a question, like two questions, kind of. First of all, um, like you mentioned, there's a huge number of cruise ships coming into the Bahamas. And we're seeing this year, I think it's in Venice, in Europe, a lot of, uh, and it's not the only place, but some regions are starting to block the amount of cruise ships coming into the region because of water and air pollution. So as the Minister of Tourism, obviously you want to increase tourism, but how do you see then cruise ships affecting um, 
the environment in the Bahamas? And is the government of the Bahamas um, trying to think of a way to lower the amount of cruise ships in return for other kinds of tourism? And the second question is we also talked about climate change today and rising waters. Um, the Bahamas is like a very, very low-lying country. Um, so that has a direct effect within the next you know, decade to your country. So obviously you're not the minister of uh, the environment, but it plays a big role in tourism. So what is the, the Ministry of Tourism trying to do in the Bahamas to kind of combat climate change? Uh, great questions. Uh, first of all, cruise ships. Uh, in the Bahamas, of our 6.4 million foreign visitors, 75% of them come by cruise ship, roughly 5 million. We are geographically blessed. We are 50, 60, 70, 100 miles away from the three busiest cruise ports in the world, namely Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Canaveral. So cruise represents a huge part of our tourism uh, product. And uh, what is wonderful about our country is we have many islands. So we can spread the cruise ships around our many islands. In fact, many of the cruise companies, uh, um, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, a Norwegian, MSC, they all have private islands in the Bahamas where they have bought, purchased islands and turned them into meccas of tourism. Uh, in, in Nassau itself, of course, that's the capital of the country. That's where the bulk of the population is. Uh, we have 3.6 million uh, cruise passengers come to Nassau every day. That's 10, I mean, every year. That's 10,000 cruise passengers each and every day of the year. So yes, you're right, there are a lot of people. Uh, what we have to do, however, is to deepen the economic impact of these cruise passengers. What we found is, given the proximity of the Bahamas to these major cruised ports, is we are experiencing destination fatigue. It's been there, done that, what's new? So these ships are turning up and people aren't necessarily even getting off. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to link, the t I always say the Ministry of Tourism is doing a great job of attracting people there, we have to link those people to our people to create deeper economic impact. I talked about brain drain. A lot of people, the, the United States is a very luring place for Bahamians. You can go there to college and never come back. And so we're having, experiencing enormous brain drain and what we're seeing is there's a lack of entrepreneurship, there's a lack of creative uh, um, uh, business talent that is figuring out how to, for lack of a better word, uh, garner more dollars out of the tourists. So it's not so much growing the number of tourists that we're focused on, it's figuring out how to get them to spend more in the destination when they get there. Climate change, wow, that's a big one. Uh, we are, you're right, the highest point in the Bahamas is 542 feet. I don't know how many that's in meters, but it ain't high. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, and we call that Mount, Mount Alverna. We consider that a mountain, 542 feet. So uh, yes, we are a very low-lying country, um, and climate change is, 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 of course, very vexing for us. Um, we are, um, are really at a loss and really don't have the capacity, a country of 390,000 people. I mean, what could we do? What could we spend? How could we protect ourselves? Um, it, it's really to the bigger countries to the north, China, your country, these countries here, that are really um, uh, must embrace uh, te uh, uh, techniques to, to combat cl climate change. There's nothing really we could do other than build bigger walls, fortify our beaches, protect our coastlines as best as we can with the limited resources that we have. But it is really not in our hands. We are a victim of this. And uh, if, if the sea, li sea, sea level rise continues to be, we will be coming to your shores looking for help. That's the bottom line. But we won't be that many people, so you can accept us with welcome arms. We're not like Nigeria. <laughs> We're only 380,000. You wouldn't even notice if we all came. Sorry, what was your question? What was, how is?
Let me deal with the second question first, ecotourism. Um, you know, most of you, some of you are not, but most of you are millennials. And what we find is, unlike our generation, where we were interested in things, you're much more interested in experiences. Okay, so uh, we, the Bahamas, as I said, is an archipelagic nation. We have Nassau, where the bulk of the population lives. So that's where you have your large resorts, your casinos, your lovely retail stores, your multiple food and beverage outlets. It's all very glitzy and very, some find wonderful. But if you really want to experience the Bahamas, the culture, the heritage, the ecotourism, we promote 16 other destinations among our 700 islands. We have um, um, many islands that are very sparsely populated, um, you know, one, two, 3,000 people tops, uh, but wonderful places to go to disconnect, to wind down, to get away, and to experience just the wonderfulness of the Bahamian people. Uh, you don't lock your doors, you don't close your windows, you, you walk, you get on your bike, you ride around, everybody. If you walk in the Bahamas and you don't hail people, if you don't say good morning, how are you, you're considered rude. So you have to engage, you have to go back to what it used to be like, where people used to talk instead of sit on their phones and disengage with people. So when you go down to those islands, that is where you get into the heart and soul of the country. And that is where you experience our culture. We're big on food. We're quite a big people. We eat a lot. We have a lot of food that we're interested in. Um, we have a, a number of festivals that, uh, that we enjoy. There's one called John Canoe, which, which really goes back to the days of slavery and what the slaves used to do uh, to celebrate um, the festival after Christmas. So we have a lot, uh, um, um, we have a lot of sa sailing tournaments. Um, it's usually to do with the, with the sea um, and, and the centers around that and food. We're big foodies. We like to eat. So um, um, when you come to the Bahamas, I, 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 I really um, invite you not just to come to Nassau. That's sort of been uh, uh, slightly Americanized. And uh, it's clean, it's clinical, it's wonderful, it's neat, it's, it's a great time. But when you go off into the other islands, that's where the true beauty of the Bahamas is. And I've traveled far and wide, gone to many countries on the planet, been to many places on the world, and I have yet to come across a country, and I'm somewhat biased, I admit, that is as beautiful as the Bahamas. <laughs> Question. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, I hate to say that my wife is from the Netherlands, <laughs> who I met in college in America. So, uh, um, no, 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 we, we mostly, uh, 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 my, uh, uh, my director of general tourism has a husband from, from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> so as the world becomes more cosmopolitan, the borders are breaking down and everybody mixing up, as we say, mixing up like conch salad. So you're all getting together and, 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 uh, and um, um, uh, making, making, making babies. Thank you.